I have nothing to say to you. Step forward. You're angry. Step forward. Forgive me. Step forward. You know the story of the Englishman in the brothel? Yes. Tell it to me. Ah, stop it. An Englishman having a drink a little more than usual proceeds to a brothel. The bard asks him if he wants a fair one, a dark one, or a red-haired one. Stop it. Exit Vladimir hurriedly. Estragon gets up and follows him as far as the limit of the stage. Give me your hand. Vladimir half turns. Embrace me. Vladimir stiffens. Don't be stubborn. Vladimir softens. They embrace. Estragon recoils. You stink of garlic. It's for the kidneys. Estragon looks attentively at the tree. What do we do now? Wait. Growing up in the inner city without a father in the household, I became more attracted to the street life. I got into a fight, and as a result of that, I ended up stabbing him. It didn't lead to death or anything like that. When I was arrested, the policeman, they told me while in the interrogation room, well, we believe that you were a part of a murder. Eventually, I was waived into the adult court and found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life sentence. In 1996, I was incarcerated. I have strong arm robberies and substantial battery, selling drugs. Um, pretty, pretty rough things. It's one thing to stand outside and, and look in and say, hey, they're never going to change these people. And I'm a living proof of that. I came to prison twice. But then it's another thing to have people who have that heart, who have that humanities, who have the want to reach out and that's what keeps people like me wanting to reach back, wanting to change. In terms of the Slavic department, and indeed many of the language and literature departments that we have in the university, graduate students have the greatest opportunity to teach Russian language, to teach Polish, to teach French and Spanish, Chinese, Korean, whatever it is. The opportunity to teach literature and broader humanities courses is much more limited. And yet this is the reason why many of these graduate students have entered graduate school. It's their love of the literature, not only the language. And the opportunity to be able to teach that, whether within the walls of the university or outside of the walls of the university, is, is magical for them. I sometimes wonder if I had chosen a different track in my life, if I had decided that I wanted to go to school for physics or something. I would vainly think that I'm intelligent enough to, to do that sort of thing, but I feel that the humanities are very worthwhile because I'm not sure that we need more bridges. We've become very enthralled with the way that technology has advanced and it's easy to think that will solve all of our problems. We still have much more human problems that are universal or are particular to our own time and we can understand them better through a more humanistic study. But with the emphasis on the sciences in today's educational system, and the humanities uh, become marginalized, but they are in fact more important. Dostoevsky is describing St. Petersburg in the 1860s. We might wonder, what does that have to do with us? But there are many parallels or contrasts that we can make that help us think about ourselves and about the world that we live in. The population of Oak Hill is 675 inmates right now. About 44% of that is African American, about 44% is white and non-Hispanic, and the remainder of that population would be uh, Hispanic and Native American and Asian. Probably 60% of the population is made up of non-violent criminals, a lot of them are property offenses. Uh, the other 40% is a makeup of assaultive crimes, which can be from homicide, 
to sexual assaults, we have drug offenders, and, and a variety of other offenses. Of that population, approximately 55 of those inmates are serving life sentences. They've served lengthy sentences in maximum and medium security facilities prior to arriving at Oak Hill. Minimum security provides for general monitoring of inmates, which means inmates have a, a little more freedom here at this facility. They're allowed to work outside the fence and within the community. We are unlike other minimums in the fact that we do have a fence here yet. We do have inmates that have a little bit higher risk rating, expansion of homes within the neighborhood, and the increase in the population in this facility and the type of inmates that are transitioned here into minimum security, it provides for public safety in, in having this facility fence. Inmates that are here have earned their way here. They've displayed good behavior over a long period of time. Here at Oak Hill, the inmates can more or less go as they please. And that's one of the incentives that most corrections departments give inmates so that if they do display good behavior, they can come to a place like this where they're allowed to go out and basically be on the yard for hours at a time. Generally, uh, every day I'll spend reading or, or writing or studying, you know, anywhere from three to eight hours. Uh, I anticipate attending UW-Milwaukee when I get out uh, for computer engineering. I would say that I am kind of a work in progress as far as who I am. A small poem I'm working on, kind of paraphrase it, pieces of myself fall away like paint chipping off of a wall. Some days I like to think they're revealing a masterpiece underneath. The Department of Corrections' primary goal is to get an education for everybody that they can walk out of here, being able to read and write and have a high school diploma. And we are quite, quite successful in doing that. We do have two vocational programs as well in construction and in horticulture. They are 15-week programs through Madison College. I have a staff of five teachers, which isn't a whole lot of teachers. Three of them are academic and two of them are vocational. So there's a number of things that we can't do, and that's kind of where the UW uh, programs fit in. We try to make the programming educational, but what we're really trying to do is get them to think, get them to realize where they're at and maybe how to correct their ways and how to become better citizens. The first time I went to Oak Hill, I was very nervous. You know, as a woman in an all-male minimum security setting, I felt there was a lot of attention on me and it was sort of nerve-wracking. At that point, I hadn't had a whole lot of teaching experience, so I felt very nervous about establishing myself as a credible, and valuable presence in the classroom. In the university setting, sometimes you can fake it a little bit. You know, the students are willing to accept you as an authority figure because they're sort of trained to do so. But in a prison setting, there's a very low threshold for any sort of pretense or artificiality. So going in there, I knew that I had to be myself and I had to be very genuine in order to establish myself as a credible instructor and also as someone who the participants could trust. I was, I was nervous because I, I didn't know what I was doing and, and they were very patient with me and respectful and they really gave me the benefit of the doubt. When I first heard that Naomi was preparing classes to go and teach in the prison, I was incredibly excited. I thought that this is really why I've been working, to excite uh, both undergraduates and graduate students about literature and about talking about literature and about bringing literature to other people. There are a number of programs that bring the university into the prison around the country, and I've known that those have been quite successful. 
One of the things that makes this program special is the focus on the graduate students. And it's not faculty who are going in to teach courses, and indeed they're not going in to teach four credit courses. These are courses that the inmates are taking voluntarily with no direct profit. Instructors who go in to teach these evening classes at Oak Hill go into it at a time. It's very good for the professional development of the graduate students. It's very good for the students in the class to have more than one instructor to, to bounce off of, uh, but it's also good for security. that it would just be a one-year experiment, an interesting thing for me to try to do. But as the year went on and I became convinced that this was a really worthwhile endeavor, I began to worry because I knew that I would be leaving at the end of the year and I put the word out among my colleagues to try to see if anyone else would be interested in taking over the project. And one of them was Colleen and I was very excited about that. Can we get our sign-in sheet? Sorry about that. Sorry. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Romanoff. We will. Alfonso. I ran that course for a year, and then Janelle and I started working together on the Friday night fiction reading course. Yeah. We've kind of been on the same page about the way that we think about the Oak Hill programs, about the class, the way that we think about the men in the class. I didn't want to set it up like any of the other classes I taught. I knew right away that like, I don't want this to be a, I'm the teacher, you're the students, you're gonna learn from me. I think we both really try to make it student-centered. We might be facilitating it, but they're driving the discussion. Any class? No, ma'am. I was. Oh, what? Have, we, one of our guys got injured. Oh, no. For basketball. Oh, okay, so you're playing. Yes. Okay. Read yeah. through part four. Right now, probably about, I think about three pages from the end of two, I think. From the end of part two. Part two. Part Are you serious? I'm gonna yeah, dunk. What, what I'm five foot nine. He just messed his knee up. He twisted his knee. I'm five foot. Like take getting out the bed. Right? You know, come on. You guys can't take my moment. I'm short. I'm white. You know, I can't do anything else. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I read the first chapter then. At first, I thought they were talking about the musicians. You have long hair and music, and I said, "Oh, they're talking about." Does everyone have a piece of paper? Does everybody have a pen? To begin things today, I'd like you guys to think about and take like a couple of minutes to address who is taking vengeance and on whom. Like who is wrong in the novel and who gets to decide who's wrong. Who we'll get to the same? Yeah. Who's wielding the justice? Who's the judge you in the know, novel? I mean, I definitely think Anna, for real, considering, um, I don't know, she's doing some real, like, skanky things, so to say. Mm -hmm. um, she, she asked Bunchy to come to the house. She's just wrong. Alexander Bitch ex the state in the marriage mm -hmm. and they stay in the house. And I guess he's trying to protect his image to some extent mm -hmm. or something. And you, you would you would think that um, if she agreed to that, that she wouldn't cross the boundary of actually having Brunsky to come to their house where they live at. She need to be um, reprimanded in some kind of way. I actually got into class by mistake. I was trying to sign up for Tuesday and Thursday creative writing, but when I ended up in fictional reading, it was cool. For me, it's like a round table um, group discussion, which makes me want to bring my A game to the table because we're sitting in a circle. And I was always no, taught was that circles like a wrong. symbol of importance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a hard time accepting the fact that um, I'm in, uh, incarcerated for this particular case, even though I'm guilty of it. But I guess my motives, I felt, was kind of like a protection of my dignity or something like that. But, you know, it's, you're wrong. You accept the fact you've done wrong and you move on. Again, I'm going to use Alexander Alexandrovich for an example. His character is well balanced. When he found out that Anna was having an affair, he didn't get angry and just make a decision based on emotion. He balanced out his position in life. He balanced on him having a family, and he thought about villainizing himself, considering he was a statesman for Russia, and he was a caretaker for their child. And he put all that into perspective before making his decision to go about trying to work his way through the marriage. 
And that's something that I that I learned and I'm actually dealing with. It kept my wheels turning since because it, it taught me to value the people around me. And I didn't used to do that. I used to be like really emotional, um, I was strung tight, considering where I'm from. I am from the west side of Chicago, where it can get um, quite stressful. You know, it's um, poverty stricken. It's, it's um, kind of like a bunch of rats fighting for cheese. This happens to be our segregation unit, our highest security level at Oak Hill. When you're here, you are in a cell. You don't leave that cell unless the officer opens the door and escorts you to a shower, or unless the officer escorts you to wreck. The other things you may be taken out of your cell for is medical treatment for a hearing for the rule violation that you committed, which actually put you here. In SEG, they have access to what's called the law library. They can also request books from the librarian. There are some statuses that will not allow you to have books. One is control status, where an inmate acts so disruptive, he has limited properties. The other status is called observation status for suicidal inmates that are either a threat to themselves or others. Yesterday, I believed I placed uh, two people in segregation. Uh, there are other times when it could go two weeks without placing anyone in seg. But if I had to guess the number of people sent from here to a higher level of security, I would say five to 10 a month. Believe it or not, it varies greatly on things such as the temperature. Some may even believe that the full moon has an effect on the way people behave. I kind of, I don't know why I wrote this down. Separate himself, sort of put people in classes. You're this lighthearted prattle of a pretty woman. Agreed with her, gave her a half joke. Before my incarceration, I had a third or fourth grade reading level. And schooling wasn't something that I really appreciated. My mother is from the South, and so she really didn't experience school as well because she had to work in the fields and that sort of thing. So once she moved to Milwaukee and brought her kids to Milwaukee, it wasn't something that was emphasized for us to do as well. So I decided to drop out of school at an early age, uh, hang out in the streets. I didn't think that education would be something that I would need for the things that I was doing at that particular time. When I was in Green Bay, there's a term that the staff and institution use, and even us inmates use, when a person returned back to SEG or, or the hold on a regular basis, we call them a SEG rat. And what that is is that they're usually troublemakers. I spent the first five years of my incarceration in SEG for doing not mature things. Um, so while I was in SIG, I tried writing my mother a letter, but I didn't know that I had put my name on the place where, where I was supposed to put my mother's name at, and instead of the letter going to my mother, it returned back to me. I was too ashamed to ask anybody why my letters kept returning. I thought that my mother had moved and she didn't want anything to do with me anymore. And so one day I built up the confidence to ask um, the staff, I said, man, why is my letter keep returning back to me? Um, and so they looked at it, and they was like, this is the problem right here. Your name is to the sender. And so by your name being in the sender, that's why the letter keep coming back to you. And so from that point on, I decided that now is the time for me to start um, the process of learning to read, to become a better communicator, just overall to better myself. And so while in SIG, um, one of the first books um, I decided to read was the dictionary. And I learned to break the words down to the point where I fell in love with English language. And so eventually when I got out of SIG, I took a test. It basically lets you know what your, where your level is. But after the five years of being in the SIG, I came out and I was reading at a post-high school level. Yep. It's like the funny expression, long in the hair, short in the eye. Don't, I cannot even get started on the like Russian proverbs about like, beat your wife and the soup will taste better. To beat somebody means to love them. One of my hobbies has been 19th century literature, in particular Russian, it gives you a different viewpoint and broadens your horizons. And Crime and Punishment is telling the story of Raskolnikov, this guy who commits a murder and basically when he gets sent to prison, it's like a redemption for him. There has been parallels in my life with uh, Raskolnikov. I mean, I've used what they've given me in here to become somebody much better than I ever was on the outs. If I get the chance to use that when I get out of here, I, I shall.
You know, I don't think that anybody who's victimized tends to really ever get vengeance in the entire story for the most part. Uh, you know, Dolly never leaves Steve up, for instance. Kitty don't never go harms too far the, ahead. What? <laughs> I said, don't, you've read the whole thing, but I, not everyone else has, so. Well, so Kitty never harms Vronsky. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Alexandrovich never duels with Vronsky either. The uh, closest thing is uh, to vengeance ends up being his refusal to grant a divorce to uh, Anna. The thing that was kind of weird was the first drive up, like the Oak Hill Lane. It's lined with these oak trees and it looks very picturesque. I mean, it looks kind of like, the, you know, going up to a mansion. When you think of a prison, you think bars, you think metal, you think cement, you think asphalt. You do not think of liberal arts college. And that's kind of what it looks like. And the men live in cottages. They don't call it necessarily a cell block, right? And it's the particularity of Oak Hill, that it was a school for girls. And then that's just juxtaposed with the fact that this is a prison and that the men are like just on the other side for crimes that they've committed, but at the same time, you know them as individuals. So those two things are very stark contrasts. You know, you establish this rapport with them, and even though you're trying to, you know, keep the student-teacher relationship intact, you're there for a long period of time, and you feel very strongly about their writing, about them as thinkers, about them as individuals, and you forget that you're at a prison and that they're there all the time. One can walk around the grounds of Oak Hill and, and, and look at the trees and look at the buildings and say, you know, this is very aesthetically appeasing to be here. But at the end of the, the day, the inmates live a, a very structured life here. So it, it's not as pleasant as one might, might assume just looking at, at the grounds of the facility. One of the things that Corrections does in most instances, it slows men down. They're living on the streets, hustling on the streets. They're getting money in any manner that they can possibly get on the streets. They're not paying attention to their families. They're not paying attention to earning a living. They're not paying attention to being law-abiding citizens. When they get incarcerated, they have that opportunity to step back, slow down, and think about what they've been doing. They're, think about their victims. since childhood, since a little kid. My father was a musician, a, a, a gospel recording artist. Uh, my mom was a musician, and I grew up falling into step with them. I am a kind of reserved individual. You know, I, I kind of stay to myself, and that's the beauty of that music room. I'm over there alone, you know, and I don't have to contend with a whole lot of people. It's a, it's a precautionary thing because I, I, I can go off sometimes. I have a short fuse. You know, I have a low tolerance for, for nonsense. You're in a fishbowl of madness sometimes and you don't want to be there. And so I, tr I choose to pull myself away from the madness and I get to a place where I can just sit and uh, reflect and write read and play music and that's what that, I'm good I'm good with that I'm cool with that you know my nickname is Unc that's what everyone calls me here it's Unc you know it's been that for years and years and years you know and I don't know sometimes I forget what my real name is you know because I'm Unc to everyone Ooh, a lot of noise I can be uh, up in my room just writing or something and some woman knock on the door and they have a question, they have an argument somewhere and they'll ask me to help them with it. Yeah, that's not too bad. 
put your phones, when you put your phones at? I'm in here for, not for harming anyone or anything like that. I'm in here for an armed robbery. On, My case was overturned. Side, but a year after it was overturned, it was camera. brought up again and I was reconvicted. Yeah. So that's where the short fuse thing comes from. I'm angry. I was angry. I was angry because my life was taken from me for something I had no knowledge or, and or participation in. While Max drives the beat. I haven't found a way to diffuse that anger yet except to get involved in the music, get involved in books in order to keep this demon I, I feel inside of me from surfacing. As the baby sings, guess who I saw today? I saw you. I saw you. That's the haiku. Okay. That's the end of that. It's really demoralizing when you show up and there's far fewer people than you expect on the roster and that you hoped for. And you start thinking about all the possible reasons why that, that might have happened. It's really tricky because all these people there are um, self-selecting. They don't get credit for it. They come because they want to. At the end of the day, you have to understand that the, the draw for a literature class is going to be pretty low, looking at the entire pop prison population there. And that's just how it happens. Absolutely, yeah. So on the flip side, my best class, hands down, that I can remember was when we read Borges' short story, The Garden of Forking Path. It's about fate, time, and it was probably the most exciting experience I've had in any classroom anywhere as a student, as a teacher, or whatever, because everyone in the class was into the story, into discussing it, into coming up with uh, plotting out different forms of time, looking at time on the paper, a straight line, a circle, the, the forking paths of the story where um, there are multiple um, dimensions of time. And it, was, it was just strange, heavy conversation that you wouldn't expect to have in a, in a place like a prison. He cradled the barrel of the shotgun in his left hand the touch of the cool steel on his skin acted as a relief against the heat of his flesh. His index finger sat gently on the trigger in his right hand, but his stomach was in knots. John remembered how his older brother had shot his foot climbing over a fence while hunting. He had lost four toes. It was all over a girl, Carla Houston. She was the first one who had been more than just a pretty face. Carla was the first one he'd ever really cared for. John adjusted his grip, then firmly planted the butt of the gun against his shoulder. Pull, he shouted. Shards of clay scattered off into the background. Pull, he shouted. This time the clay disc slowly floated to the ground. Maybe next time, Carla's father, Colonel Houston, told him as his large hand briefly swallowed the whole of John's shoulder. While the colonel was shooting, John's stomach began to fill with anxiety. On the way back to the lodge, the gravel crunched and complained at the weight of the colonel's frame. When they arrived, they sat down at the bar. The colonel looked down at the bartender and said, one beer for me and one for this here young buck. During the shooting, John had only hit three pigeons, but that was OK. He didn't care about the score. All that mattered to John right now was about to be decided for better or worse. Colonel Houston, sir? Yeah, kid, I need to ask you something. The colonel had met John before, but he looked the young man up and down in a way that seemed to John as if he were really seeing him as a man for the first time. Don't worry, the colonel began. I only hit a couple my first time out, too. It gets easier. John took a sip of his beer. No, it's not that, sir. It's, it's, well, I wanted to ask you, it's about your daughter. What about my little girl? As the colonel said those words, a couple of veins popped out on his neck, but John had to continue. It was too late to turn back now. 
I would like your permission to ask your daughter for her recipe for blueberry pie for my mother. The colonel chuckled. You know, I almost thought I was going to have to shoot you. I thought you were going to ask if you could marry my Carla. Johnny swallowed. No, 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 sir. It's just that my mother can't make no pie like that. And since it's a family recipe, Carla says she can't just give it to me like that. Well, son, I'm afraid I can't help you with that one. She's got a mind of her own, but I'll tell you what. If you can beat me next time we shoot, I'll let you marry her. She probably still won't give up that recipe, but at least you know you'll always get some on holidays. Comments? No. I see how you made a couple of revisions in it, though. That's not, that's beautiful. But you got a lot of great suspense going, mm -hmm. um, but then you kind of undercut it a bit. He did not like guns. And then you go to the story about his brother, right? But there's a sentence in between. There's like, he did not like guns. In fact, he was terrified of them. I would just get rid of, in fact, he was terrified about, of them because you show that. Uh, I've been on this particular institution for about a, a year and a quarter. I'm looking at getting out roughly another year and a half. I try to stay focused on whatever it is I'm doing and be in the present moment. It's you know, easier to get through my time like that. You know, naturally, you know, the mind's going to go off and start musing on you know, the past or the future. There's absolutely nothing I can do to change any of the past, and you know, the future is you know, not you know, here, so I can't really do anything much about it can make uh, tentative plans, you know, but how many times do you want to plan the same thing? It gets kind of pointless, you know. <laughs> going to get out, going to go to college, you know, going to get a job. My actions, uh, mine alone, brought me where I am. I'm not going to sit here blaming other people for my problems. It doesn't do any good. Even if I wanted to, you know, harbor some sort of resentment, that would only hurt me. I really like thinking about work as a positive thing. It's maybe I'm from New England and maybe that has something to do with it, but there's a, a profound difference between work and drudgery. And drudgery is the labor that you don't want to do, that you do because you feel compelled to. Work is, for me anyways, more of the labor that I, that I want to do, that I enter into freely and that I feel some level of control over. So the great thing about our job as graduate students, at least for me, is that my work very rarely feels like work. But sometimes it can. Sometimes um, grading homework until all hours of the night or trying to read 200 pages in Russian before two hours from now, and that very rarely works out. And there never works out, actually. All the same, the class at the prison becomes a refresher from that work. I've found frequently that, uh, that I leave the class thinking about something quite differently and the experience has been shared by other instructors who have said, I hated this book before we started talking about it, but now I think that it's rather interesting. I leave the prison feeling rejuvenated uh, by the, just by the experience on the whole. I had no direction in life, no positive set of values. You go down, you go down the path and not caring, just doing stuff to be doing it and get out there using drugs, boozing it up, staying up all night, and all of a sudden you find yourself in a place and you don't know where, where or what you want to do with it. A couple of stupid things happen, next thing you know, you're in prison for the rest of your life. And 
going from there, the, it was just like a shock. It's my philosophy that in order for a person to be successful when he gets out of corrections, they need uh, a family that's supportive and a community that's supportive. They need an education and they need a job. A lot of inmates don't really realize they're transitioning to a society that only has rules. Once they get outside that fence, they're back into the communities. Communities is made up of rules, the laws. So every level you have, you have increased laws. So we have more policies and procedures than mediums and maximums. Maximum, they tell you where to move, they'll escort you. Mediums is a little bit different. We're a little more lenient than that. Once they get into the community, all they have is rules. Nobody's going to tell them where they're going. Nobody's going to tell them what time they have to be there. They have to do it themselves. Yeah, there are a lot of rules here because we're transitioning. We're coming home now. We've already done the majority of our time, and so we're trying to learn to come back to society and to reintegrate into that way of life. You ever did any watercoloring? When I was a young kid, I was diagnosed with a hyperactivity disorder with not having the attention, so schooling for me was rough. I knew the material, but I wouldn't really retain anything. I could, it was easy for me to be in the class at the time, but it was really, really hard for me to concentrate, and so I goofed off and doodled on pages and did things that I probably wasn't supposed to do. I say that my educational background was only to junior high, and then I was incarcerated at the age of 15. When I came into prison, we can always have the prison knowledge. And the prison knowledge is uh, how to get over on the next person, the hustle bustle, from doing maximum security time to do all the way back down to um, medium and minimum. But I came into prison in 1996. I got out in 2006. And I had the bright idea that I was going to be a drug dealer. <laughs> that bright idea was the most ignorant decision I've ever made in my life because I had all the opportunities in front of me. Recreation period for the games, it's rare that it falls on the night that we have a study. Hands down, I'd want to be with literature. And the reason I say that is because basketball, the game never changes. <laughs> it's three-pointers and two-pointers and running screens and pick and rolls, and that's just what basketball is. But more importantly to me is if you learn something new, if I learn something today and I learn something tomorrow, then I'm making progress. If I don't learn anything within each day that I'm given, then I'm just, as they say, kicking a dead horse. In his development in this picture here, I see that he's kind of created um, a sense of knowing his colors and working with the warm colors. He's got a sense of depth, you know, creating the front, uh, middle ground, and background. I've worked at Oak Hill for approximately 29 years. I've had guys that come through that have learned how to play guitar. They've learned how to play flute. Or they've learned how to write poetry. They've learned how to express that creativity inside of them, which they didn't know how to do it before. As tough as it is to say, a lot of them do have a lot of time. And so what I tell them is to use your time wisely. Don't use your time by just sitting around doing nothing because in the end, your time will go slower. And on the positive side, what you learn, you'll take with you. It's a successful painting, in my opinion. When I had participants who regularly came to class, I saw a lot of confidence building. To be able to relate to another person, not as a prisoner-prisoner relationship, or not as a prisoner-guard relationship, but as a human being, human being relationship, it was really great to see how that confidence would build. He who have ears to hear, let him hear. The spirit has been poured upon all flesh, but thine hearts are closed and thine eyes are at rest. 
Thy minds are trapped in the jaws of the Loch Ness. He who have ears to hear, let him hear. Surely a soul of the Spirit remember the Most High's might. He who have ears to hear, let him hear. The speaking tongues, they assert that the anointings of the Most High have come. Yet you understand not the rule of thumb. Rise, O God, send the beast from whence he come. Consecrate the humble ones. He who have ears to hear, let him hear. Have you not seen things come I don't to view poetry as something Trump? that I enjoy, to be quite frank with you. I look at poetry from a utilitarian point of view. And if you are able to read poetry, you're going to be able to fill out a job application. You're going to be able to express yourself. If you can imagine a person in a room 24 hours a day, eventually they're going to get frustrated being in that room. Literature is a light at the end of the tunnel. If his mind is on poetry, his mind is less likely on how can I smuggle in a cell phone? How can I get this over a guard? How can I smuggle contraband in? So it has more to do with what you do with your time. You can either use it productively or you can use it uh, counterproductively. Why are they waiting for them? Mm -hmm. and why going through all these conversations about hanging themselves and carrying them while they're waiting for them? That's yeah. I'm trying to piece all that together. Fine. But that's a paradox, right? They say, we're waiting for you now. And they, they kind of make it sound like at first, like it is somewhat important that they talk to him. He's going to be able to tell them something really important or something like that, right? Yeah, I've been waiting for something for a long time. I don't know if I've been, been waiting for life for a long time, you know, uh, waiting for my life to resurface. As you progress down through the security ratings, you get to a place like this, hope is alive again. What happens now is that you do not want to disturb that hope in any way. You want to just let it keep flowing. This is going on my 29th year in prison. What I had decided to do years ago was that I was going to create something positive. I was going to create an identity in myself. And the identity that I eventually created was that of compassion, that of love, and that of great forgiveness. It takes a lot of energy to wake up every morning to be angry. But it takes less energy to wake up in the morning and just love people, um, forgive people, and just embrace them. Um, and just know that all of us made mistakes. Some of us made greater mistakes than others, but I have to continue to, to, to be a difference maker. Z, uh, just try to find your ass right there. So I just want you to do the perimeter, but if you don't got the, the full, you don't got the formulas to it, you ain't gonna be able to come, come to that answer. I don't really think about what the men have done in the past or what they're in the prison for or how long they're gonna be there. We don't ask the question if they wanna share it because it comes up from what our, our literary discussion. They bring it up, of course. We want it to be a safe environment where they can share that information, but it's kind of a don't ask, don't tell. It doesn't really change anything for me in terms of like how I run the classroom or how I interact with that person. So if anything, it kind of pushes me to challenge them a little bit more with more sensitive readings with more in-depth questions with yeah. something that really kind of takes them out of their comfort zone in terms of what they've thought about in the past and pushing them into something new. We're there to teach. They might offer us information, but it gets hazy because some of them are creative writing classes, they're writing poetry, it informs the reading of their texts, their past experiences, so we cannot ignore that. But at the same time, it's like it cannot be limited to that because it's like that's a beginning step, but now we need to like take it further. So it's it's, it's complicated, right? Those type of things is what I pick up from the class and literature. And with that is, is, is women and that women do have feelings. And seeing that Anna Karenia actually had some 
issues she was dealing with with Alexander Alexandrovich that she wasn't able to just outright reveal to him because of the type of person he was. He was like this mockingly, somewhat condescending toward her. So it made her hard to communicate her feelings with him. And I guess that kind of created her need for fulfillment somewhere else. To be able to put both of the stories in perspective and look at it as the third party reading a book, it's like, wow, these type of things unfold like that. So it gives you real life scenarios so that you're able to make better choices in the future. I was 21 years old when I come in. I'll be 53 this year. The rap prison gets these days, you wouldn't think anybody would want to even come in here. I mean, some of us have done some pretty horrible things. Not that, not that we're still horrible persons, but I guess we're supposed to be here to be punished, but having somebody come in here and take an interest in this, it, it's real nice. I was particularly blown away when I brought in uh, my favorite poem by Pushkin, which is called The Prophet. It's about a poet who is walking in the wasteland and he gets his tongue ripped out and a serpent's tongue put in in the place of it by an, an angel. And his heart is ripped out and replaced with a burning coal. At the end of the poem, when the poet is told to go and ignite the hearts of men, we're not really sure if, if this is a good thing or a bad thing. It's very powerful and it's terrifying, but also awe-inspiring and Months later, when I asked the participants what their favorite authors were, many of them said Pushkin. Pushkin is considered often the Shakespeare of Russia. And I felt that there was something really amazing that happened, that my participants connected with a very deep and complex poem. My assumption is that there are still 85% of the prisoners for whom this is totally uninteresting and will not affect them in any way whatsoever. That's okay, there are other things for them. But that having this available for those that it will make a difference is, um, is really important. I don't deny that there are people in prison who are in prison for excellent reasons and there is part of me that hopes they stay there forever and ever. But I also think that perhaps even them, but a large number of the prisoners have spaces within them that can grow, that can learn to be productive in society. At the end of the day, inmates are human beings just like you and I. The only difference is that they've committed crimes, they've been sentenced by the courts for incarceration, and 98% of these people are going to be returning to the community as our neighbors. I think society would probably be much worse off if we were to not provide educational opportunities and programming. Every person that we can get back into society to become a productive member, to not commit crimes, to pay their taxes, to get a job, and to reintegrate, I think is, is virtually priceless. Once you come to prison, you still have a chance. You just have to apply yourself. The participants there always thank us and say they get so much out of it, but I really feel that I and the other volunteers, Zach and Colleen and everyone else, um, get just as much, if not more, out of it. The main thing I've learned, we can talk about texts in a much different way than we do in the university and in typical classrooms. Things can get very clinical and you end up in a bubble in how you talk about literature and it becomes disconnected from the real world. But there, I've learned how to, to sort of bring those two together and that there is value in relating the literature to your own life and to, to see how you can learn about other people through literature and through stories, the stories that we tell and the stories we read. I don't claim to have any answers at all. I don't claim to understand everything that we read or to have some deep meaning, some key to the lock that will open up all of life within a work is not what I'm there for. I'm there, and hopefully because I'm there, that feeling of being a valuable human being reasserts itself within the participants. If you don't teach these guys before they get out, 
what they can do as far as education or rehabilitation or recreation, leisure time activity. If you do not give that, that outlet to them, their success is not going to happen when they get out. They're just gonna go back and do the same thing. It's not ever been any motivation for me to be there, to, to come in and this save you kind of thing. That's not my purpose behind it. And, and it's, that's kind of creepy. Yeah, it's, uh, as a grad student, I work three jobs. There are times when I go, you know, it's Friday, I have to be out the prison, I don't want to go. And the minute I walk into that classroom, they really wake me up and remind me why I'm doing what I'm doing. Like, this is why I'm in, in grad school. This is why I want to teach, because I want to be able to reach people through literature. So I think that the classroom, actually the dynamic, is returning that, that moment of like actual conversation that we've lost. And you have it teaching in any, in any setting, this kind of like uplifting experience and that you get energy out of the classroom. But with the men especially, because you know that they're looking forward to it all week. If there weren't intelligent and interested men in this class, there wouldn't be a class for us. We'd be sitting talking to ourselves yes. basically about books. Which is, would be which wonderful, fun, but not the right. same.
the sun. 